George Shultz has struggled to find a solution to Middle East hatred and sought to build new relations with America's allies. Now he will take on his greatest challenge, seeking an end to the nuclear arms race. On his watch, the conditions were set to bring the Cold War to an end. He's going to go down in history as the person who was most important in ending the Cold War. Secretary George Shultz was a major figure in our talks. After 40 years of Cold War, George Shultz will help set the stage for a more peaceful era. Major funding for this program was provided by the Annenberg Foundation, the Stephen Bechtel Fund, Doris and Donald Fisher, John A. Gunn and Cynthia Fry Gunn, the Charles and Ann Johnson Foundation, Peter G. Peterson, Charles Schwab, and Ambassador Thomas and Barbara Stevenson. In the 12th century, a Japanese shogun grew impatient with the poor skill of his archers. He ordered his warriors to begin a special practice. They would be required to fire at targets while riding horseback at full gallop without hands on the reins. Their enormous discipline and concentration became known as Yabusame. As time passed, it evolved from practical archery practice into a Shinto rite practice to please the many gods that watch over Japan. Today, these modern archers are practicing to demonstrate their sacred Yabusame skills for two special visitors coming from America. It is November of 1983. The President of the United States and his Secretary of State are on their way to Japan for an important visit. This is the President's cabin on Air Force One. And this was his privileged sanctuary. He had a bed, a desk, a place for a guest to come and talk. And uh, he kept to himself a good part of the time, but then you, I would get invited up, and some others would occasionally, to chat with him, and you'd sit here and talk. It's very informal here. It's not a big space. Most of the serious discussion had taken place before we boarded, and we knew where we were going and why, and, and had lots of briefings and so on. And to a certain extent, in the trip, you wanted to relax a little bit, because when you get to where you're going, you want to be in as good shape as possible. Schultz is confident that he and the president will be well received. Schultz has already developed great respect for Japan's prime minister, Yoshihiro Nakasone. I had known him slightly before he became prime minister. And I remember when it was announced, I went to President Reagan and said, this man is a different kind of prime minister than we dealt with before. He's much more assertive. A lot will be on the line when Reagan and his Secretary of State arrive in Japan, especially over the contentious issue of trade. As Air Force One crosses the Pacific, sales of Japanese goods, such as cars and electronics, have swollen the trade deficit between the two countries to $20 billion a year in Japan's favor. Nearly one in four cars sold in the U.S. is Japanese. The media and Congress alike 
are howling for trade sanctions and tariffs against Japanese goods. There were many who felt that the Japanese manufacturing procedures uh, were giving them an advantage that not only uh, was going to create a huge uh, deficit in our trade relationship, maybe even jeopardize our currency, but certainly would jeopardize our jobs. It was not a pleasant time for that trip, but nevertheless, uh, it was very important that the trip be taken. George Schultz is very opposed to trade sanctions or tariffs and recognizes that he and Reagan must persuade the Japanese to open their markets to American products. Now, if you say that I'm not going to import anything from you, I'm going to put a tariff on the things that I might import from you, but I want to export my things to you, that, that's not going to work. That's going to cause you to put up barriers as well. So if we can keep the barriers down, we can all benefit. That's the theory of open trading, and it works. It is indeed a great pleasure to welcome the President of the United States of America and Mrs. Reagan as state guests. Schultz and Reagan present their case. Schultz suggests that Japan must begin to move from an economy almost totally dependent on exports to one equally driven by domestic investment and consumer demand. I truly respect and appreciate Mr. Schultz's belief and policy regarding the imbalance in our trade during the 1980s. He was committed to maintaining a good relationship between our countries. There was a three-way partnership in developing a great relationship between our countries, Mr. Reagan, George Schultz, and myself. Partially through Schultz's product, Japanese officials will eventually agree to restrictions on exports of autos to the U.S., and Nakasone will begin to wean the Japanese economy off its dependence on exports. But Japan also has its own shopping list of issues for discussion. Soviet SS-20 intermediate range missiles in Asia are aimed at Japan. Nakasone is aware the U.S. intends to press the Soviets for removal of these missiles in Europe. Now he asks that the Americans demand the missiles be removed from Asia as well. Schultz promises there will be no discussion with the Soviets about missiles that does not include Japan's interests. George Schultz promised and kept his word concerning the SS-20 missiles in Asia. It was negotiated that the Soviet missiles would be withdrawn, and that was thanks in great part to George Schultz. The trip further solidifies the good relationship between the U.S. and Japan. As a symbol of the successful visit, Ronald Reagan becomes the first American president invited to address the Diet, the Japanese parliament. Reagan's speech will provide George Schultz with an enormous diplomatic opportunity. I know I speak for people everywhere when I say our dream is to see the day when nuclear weapons will be banished from the face of the earth. We want significant reductions, and we're willing to compromise. A nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. They are stunning words for an American president that has increased his country's military spending by almost 35 percent, and who many have branded a warmonger. This speech in Japan marks the first time that Reagan has indicated he is willing to move beyond arms limitations to arms reductions. He said that in his view, we'd all be better off if there were no nuclear weapons. Abolish them. People never took him seriously when he said that. The Japan trip is an enormous success, thanks in great part to the efforts of George Shultz by 1986, the Japanese will at last open their markets to American telecommunication equipment, medical technology, pharmaceutical supplies, and forest products. Japan will continue to dominate the balance of trade, but at least the process is no longer a one-way street. Other Asian issues weigh heavily on the mind of George Schultz. Perhaps the most unstable situation in Asia at this time is playing out in the Philippines. President Ferdinand Marcos has long been a reliable anti-communist ally of the United States. 
He supported America in the Vietnam War and has allowed the U.S. to lease critical military bases in the Philippines. Ferdinand Marcos has also been an intolerant dictator. In the past year, he has increasingly been stung by the verbal attacks of Ninoy Aquino, an exiled but very popular opposition reformer. In September of 1982, Aquino returns to the Philippines to continue his challenge to Marcos. As he makes his way off the plane, he is shot and killed on the airport tarmac. Evidence immediately points to the Marcos regime and sets off virulent protests by thousands of Aquino supporters. Aquino's death will eventually come back to haunt the Marcos government. However, as Schultz returns to Washington from Japan, it is Latin America and not Asia that is at the center of his radar. In 1982, congressional passage of the Boland Amendment had officially ruled out the use of Defense Department or CIA funds to help the Nicaraguan Contra rebels. Reagan advisors and political supporters who favor the rebels' cause are not content to abandon it. They keep the issue in front of the president. They trot in the most impressive Contra leaders they could find. He didn't know who they were. They had been well briefed on what you told Ronald Reagan about freedom fighting and they'd leave the office, and Reagan would turn to whoever was left and say, we've got to do something. Well, Reagan loved the Contras because they're the kind of guys who are the good guys in movies, uh, and he really believed uh, that they were something like the men who came down the hill and conquered. And beyond that, it was almost all kind of romantic imagination in his mind. Reagan is determined that congressional action will not stop American support for a group he sees as heroes. He gives off-the-record instructions to his new national security advisor, Bud McFarlane. I want you to do whatever you have to do to help these people keep body and soul together. Do everything you can. Schultz argues that there must be some other way to deal with Nicaragua than through the schemes he knows are being created by some in the White House. He is convinced such schemes will eventually weaken this president. Those around the president believed that the way to deal with the Nicaraguans was through a Contra effort. They didn't base their whole policy on that, but they thought it was crucial to have a military side to this policy that was going to push the Nicaraguans, and the Contra effort was their answer to this. Without the knowledge of the Secretary of State, National Security Advisor Bud McFarlane begins to recruit third-party donors to contribute money to the Contras. McFarlane, his assistant John Poindexter, and a Marine Lieutenant Colonel attached to the National Security Council staff named Oliver North also begin to consider other ways to raise money without congressional knowledge. A plan is developed to secretly sell American weapons to Iran. The plan will have two purposes. In exchange for the weapons, Iran will agree to release American hostages such as Terry Anderson, now held by Hezbollah, Iran's surrogate militia in Lebanon. In addition, profits from the weapon sales will be secretly transferred by the CIA to the Contra rebels in Nicaragua. And the president felt very uh, deeply about the Americans that were held hostage in the Beirut area. And it really, it bothered him. And so when people came and said, we should sell some arms to Iran, and by the way, Mr. President, we can get our hostages out, that clicked with him. And they got him on the hook that way. And to start moving military equipment around uh, without having the active participation of the military and to engage in diplomacy with Iran without the support of the State, Depart State Department was extremely dangerous. Bribing Iran for hostage release is against Reagan's stated policy. Giving money to the Contras is against the law. It was against our policy, and as it drifted into 
getting hostages back, I oppose it even more vigorously because if you pay for getting hostages back, all you're doing is inviting people to take more hostages. It's commerce without end. I have no doubt that George Shultz did go to Ronald Reagan and saying, there's a lot of funny business going on around here. Uh, you, you better do something about it. But once Reagan had made up his mind and Schultz saw this is a no-win situation, he moved his fingerprints as far away from that business as he could and waited it out. That was one of the great things about work, working for George, George Schultz. Uh, you, you had never any doubt that uh, you were only to be uh, doing what was uh, right, legal, and moral, uh, and ethical. So when it came to uh, uh, arms uh, for the Contras, uh, it was illegal. We don't do it. Some have also suggested the Secretary of State decided not to oppose the president for tactical reasons, that he was less interested in Central America than other areas of foreign policy. Privately, we know that, first of all, he discounted Central America. He had put himself in an inferior political position by essentially saying other things are more important. And Shell simply wasn't going to confront the president on an issue like that when he was working very hard to bring the president along on the crucial issue of U.S.-Russia. Fearing Schultz's opposition, McFarlane and the others deliberately keep the Secretary of State out of the loop in planning the Iran-Contra operation. On April 16, 1984, the Wall Street Journal drops a political bombshell. It reports that the CIA is mining harbors in Nicaragua. Reagan's approval ratings with Americans are falling. He reacts by playing what is always his strongest card. He goes on national television to defend his actions. The Sandinista rule is a communist reign of terror. The simple questions are, will we support freedom in this hemisphere or not? Will we defend our vital interests in this hemisphere or not? Will we stop the spread of communism in this hemisphere or not? Will we act while there is still time? Thank you, God bless you, and good night. In meeting after meeting with Reagan and his staff, Schultz tries to discourage any attempts to go around the Congress. But in the end, the tide of thinking among White House security advisors and the priorities of the president further isolate Schultz from any contra planning. He was never a loud man, so he wasn't shouting it from the rooftops. But he said what he had to say on it and realized that uh, Reagan was going to do it. Schultz has made his feelings known. He turns his attention to other matters. What he's not aware of is that Casey, McFarlane, Poindexter, and others are already up to their necks in indictable offenses. And it is only the beginning. Ronald Reagan's second inauguration day dawns clear but bitterly cold. With a wind chill of 40 below, the public swearing in is moved into the rotunda of the Capitol. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. This president has spent much of his first term creating the greatest peacetime military force the world has ever seen. Now he announces that his highest priority will be the reduction of nuclear arms. We will meet with the Soviets hoping that we can agree on a way to rid the world of the threat of nuclear destruction. Reagan had been horrified after his first inauguration to learn the apocalyptic numbers of the Cold War. By his second inauguration, the total world stockpile of nuclear weapons exceeds 50,000 bombs and warheads. These have a combined explosive force of 22,000 million tons of TNT, or one and a half million times the explosion created at Hiroshima. 
And Ronald Reagan felt that this was basically immoral. That is, what's so good about a peace based on our ability to wipe each other out? There's got to be a better way. The opportunity to seek that better way soon presents itself in the form of yet another Kremlin funeral. Konstantin Chernenko, the first secretary of the Communist Party of the USSR, is dead. Like Andropov before him and Brezhnev before that, Chernenko had been a product of the old Soviet system, built around a commitment to isolationism and inflexibility in world affairs. The man who will replace Chernenko is a very different kind of communist leader. No other element will define the Reagan and Schultz years like their ensuing relationship with Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. George Schultz attends the Chernenko funeral and meets the new Communist Party secretary. He is impressed. I remember saying when we got back to the people in our delegation, the vice president and others, that this is a very different kind of Soviet leader than anybody we've engaged with before. He's quicker, he's more knowledgeable about vast areas of the world, and he's going to be more formidable in many ways. He was a completely different type. The previous leaders, they were bureaucrats, uh, very doctrinaire, very much part of the communist system. Now, Gorbachev had also risen through the communist system, but he began to talk about glasnost and perestroika, about political reform, economic reform. He represented a significant departure. I had been to the Soviet Union a number of times. I'd met with his predecessors. I'd met with Brezhnev. I'd met with Kosygin. Uh, but Gorbachev, uh, he was different. He was, he was completely different. He was better educated than they were, having traveled in the West, reading widely uh, about the West. Gorbachev was totally a breath of fresh air, a guy you could understand, a guy who would talk, who you could get answers out of. Gorbachev has no memories of the revolution and was only a boy during the horror of World War II. He holds degrees in law, agronomy, and economics, the first Soviet leader with a college degree since Lenin. He and his highly educated wife, Raiza, are more likely to choose a vacation in France or Italy over the dowdy Crimean resorts favored by past Soviet leaders. Most important, Gorbachev is a realist about the condition of the Soviet Union. The arms race is bleeding the country to death. While billions of rubles are poured into misery and foreign adventures, Soviet citizens stand in line to buy bread. For the average Soviet worker, cars, washing machines, or a comfortable apartment are impossible dreams. It is said that on the day he was appointed General Secretary of the Communist Party, Gorbachev came home to his wife and said of their country, we can't go on like this. Schultz saw it as a tremendous opportunity. He understood that Gorbachev had a different frame of mind, and he did not let that opportunity pass us by. It is March 1985. Encouraged by his Secretary of State, the President drafts a letter to General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev. In it, Ronald Reagan does what many had thought unthinkable for this President. He invites a communist leader to pay him a visit. Dear Mr. General Secretary, I would like you to visit me in Washington at your earliest convenient opportunity. And I want you to know that I look forward to a meeting that could yield results of benefit to both our countries. Five thousand miles away in the Kremlin, Reagan's letter is read with interest by Gorbachev. The American president will not have long to wait for a reply. March 24th. Dear President Reagan, I would like to say that we deem improvement of relations between the USSR and the USA to be not only extremely necessary, but possible, too. I have a positive attitude to a personal meeting between us. Sincerely, Mikhail Gorbachev. 
April the 4th, dear Secretary Gorbachev, I look forward to meeting you personally at a mutually convenient time. And let me affirm the value I place in our correspondence. I hope we can continue to speak frankly, sincerely, Ronald Reagan. Schultz is eager to follow up on the exchange of letters. Overcoming aggressive protests from Weinberger and other hardliners in the White House, he persuades Reagan to authorize his meeting with Andrei Gromyko, the Soviet foreign minister. The meetings began in Vienna in January of 1985. Well, we, had a, we have a convention when we go into the room. He goes to the left and I go to the right. Schultz's humor does not obscure the fact that Andrei Gromyko represents old-line Soviet foreign policy, dogmatic, suspicious, and confrontational. In spite of that, George Schultz has no problems dealing with the tough old Bolshevik. My idea is that strength and negotiations go together. And it's right there in the great seal of our republic. Because there is an eagle. In one talon, the eagle is holding an olive branch. In the other, arrows. Negotiations with no strength behind them, you're going to get your head handed to you regularly. So don't do it. Schultz also has a perfect sense of the position of the man he is representing in these negotiations. He learned how Reagan thought, and he respected Reagan. And uh, I think that uh, uh, that was important uh, to both men. He was originating and, and advancing policies, but those that he felt, and in most cases he knew, would be uh, in consonance with uh, President Reagan's thinking because he talked to him about it. From Gromyko's behavior, it is clear that his boss, Mikhail Gorbachev, is pushing for change. But nothing is said about a summit meeting. Schultz has instructed his staff not to push on the issue of the summit. In May 1985, a sixth and final meeting is held in Vienna. And then afterwards, uh, the meeting had broken up. He asked me to step aside. And he said, what about the summit? I said, well, what about it? Because we had thought that there should be a summit meeting. And he said, well, we could have a summit in Moscow. I said, no. The last one was in Moscow. The next one is in Washington. And he said, well, maybe we should have a warm-up and have it in Geneva. So eventually that worked out. The agreement to move toward a summit is a tremendous victory for Schultz's faith in diplomacy. However, the Secretary of State returns not to applause, but to opposition and hesitation. Schultz's desire to negotiate proves too much for many in the president's inner circle. This caused a tremendous uproar and pushback from Secretary Weinberger and others in the administrations who believed that what the Reagan presidency really was, was America must be strong, and that's it. And that any attempt to get into negotiations with the Soviets would be a sign of weakness. Weinberger and many others felt that meeting the Russians, that Reagan would give away the store. They were worried about him. Ronald Reagan dislikes confrontation with members of his staff. At cabinet meetings, he now seeks a middle road, saying perhaps the summit deserves more thought, and perhaps he should play hard to get. Schultz is convinced of the enormous potential in a summit meeting with Gorbachev. He seeks a compromise with his fellow cabinet members, but their opposition to the summit is firm. So within the administration, there's tremendous backbiting and struggles over this, with Schultz uh, really, in some sense, being isolated by many of the most significant and influential people in Reagan's administration who thought, this can't be President Reagan doing this. It must be that rat George Schultz who's poisoned his mind. And if we can just get through to the president, he'll shut Schultz down. Reagan's apparent willingness to appease Bill Casey, Weinberger, and the others is tremendously discouraging for the Secretary of State. Occasionally I had my frustrations, and 
And I, on more than one occasion, told him that there are all these differences of opinion, and uh, I'm easy to get rid of if, if you want to get somebody else here. But he wanted me to stay. Feeling he has nothing to lose, Schultz challenges the president, saying, many key people in your administration do not want a summit. You have to make up your mind. You have to step up to the plate. The tactic works. Five days later, Ronald Reagan approves plans for a summit. He will meet Mikhail Gorbachev in Geneva on November 19, 1985. Now more than ever, conservatives around the president worry about his ability to go one-on-one -on -one with the younger Gorbachev. George Shultz is not concerned. I had uh, great confidence in President Reagan, and he had great confidence in himself. President Reagan had thought about his positions a great deal. He was not going to be buffaloed. He enjoyed being underrated because the people who underrated him, he left standing there and went right by him. What is cause for concern is the discovery in July of a cancerous polyp in the president's intestine. The polyp is removed, and by August, Reagan leaves Bethesda Naval Hospital in a confident mood and heads for his ranch near Santa Barbara, California. But while he recuperates, a scene is taking place on the other side of the world that will eventually cause the president as much pain as his surgery. At Mehrabad Airport near Tehran, Iran, 16 wooden crates containing American anti-tank missiles are unloaded from a secret cargo flight. This is the first shipment devised by National Security Advisor Bud McFarlane. His plan is to free American hostages in Lebanon and generate money for the Contra rebels in Nicaragua. This illegal plan is so secret, few people yet understand the danger this scheme will pose to the survival of the Reagan administration. This is Ronald Reagan, President of the United States, speaking to you from Washington about my upcoming meeting with General Secretary Gorbachev in Geneva. I hope my discussions with Mr. Gorbachev will be fruitful and will lead to future meetings. Everything has a season. Let us hope as we near Christmas and the New Year that this will be the season for peace. After months of preparation by George Shultz, the time has arrived. The leaders of the world's two great superpowers will at last come together. Beautiful Lake Geneva separates this old city. But the city itself has often offered its impartial ambiance to bring together parties in international disputes. Now, for the first time in six years, Geneva will host a face-to-face -face meeting between an American president and a Soviet leader. It has been billed only as a get-acquainted meeting, but it will become much more. Well, the move was calm as we flew to Geneva. There was a certain amount of controversy about the, whether the meeting should go on, but President Reagan was determined. He was very comfortable with himself. The first meeting in Geneva will take place in a rented lakeside chateau. Nothing is left to chance. The President and the Secretary of State tour the grounds and plan to the smallest detail where and how the meeting will progress. Even the gardens are scattered by Ronald and Nancy Reagan as a possible walking route for the two leaders. There's a lot of work and preparation that goes on before. There has to be an agenda. You have to know what you're trying to accomplish. You don't go to a summit just to sit and chat. There's absolutely no doubt that when you see a summit meeting on television, you are looking at a number of phenomena. First, there have been weeks of preparation of every practical problem. By the time Reagan and Schultz sit down in Geneva, the president has attended numerous briefings and read stacks of informational reports. He and Nancy have even watched several Soviet films. The preparations go on right up to the day of the meeting. 
Foreign Service Officer Jack Matlock will play the part of Gorbachev in mock debates. I played Gorbachev speaking Russian uh, through the interpreter that we would be using, uh, and um, I was able to pick up what Gorbachev would be saying because he had said much of it on television. Chief of Staff Don Regan is worried this bit of theater will be trivialized by the press. I would not want under any circumstances that any of us mention to the press in any shape or fashion that we rehearsed the president today or that he went through uh, play acting with uh, somebody taking the part of Gorbachev. That's the last thing in the world we need. Finally, the day arrives. Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev will meet at last. Gorbachev gets out of his car and he's all bundled up. Reagan comes down the steps greeting him. He has no overcoat on or anything. And the image right away is Reagan is the young man. And um, that first image that people saw. There's nothing wrong with knowing how to create an image. Reagan leads Gorbachev to a small room with a fire. The two begin talking with only translators present. There's a person in the White House whose job it is to let people know it's time to end a meeting. And the meeting was supposed to go, I don't know, 15 minutes and half an hour, three quarters of an hour, and he came, should I go and break up that meeting? I said, are you out of your mind? The longer they're there, the better it is, because they're feeling each other out. The two leaders are feeling each other out, but as they engage in their first fireside conversation, their fundamental view of each other does not change. Mikhail Gorbachev remembers. <laughs> I went back to my delegation after the first one-on-one, -on -one, and my delegation members asked me, what's your impression of Reagan? And I said, he's a real dinosaur. And then we learned that Reagan was asked the same question by his delegation, and he said, Gorbachev is a diehard Bolshevik. Certainly the beginning was a difficult one. <laughs> After a short break, the two sides move to a formal conference room where the talks proceed with the full staffs. The initial pleasantries soon dissolve into straight talk. Reagan does not mince words. Your government has talked of one communist world fomenting revolutions everywhere. I've told you as frankly as I can that we fear you. Gorbachev is equally direct and grows irritated. He disputes Reagan's claims of a Soviet arms buildup. He points to Reagan's strategic defense initiative as the source of a new arms race. Your SDI program will lead to an arms race in space, which is not only defensive, but offensive. Space weapons will be hard to verify and will feed suspicions. We will not help in your plans. Reagan says that the United States will share any important discoveries on his Star Wars system with the Soviets, but Gorbachev does not take the bait. Your own Secretary Weinberger has said that if the USSR had such a defense first, it would be bad. So if we go first, you feel it would be bad for the world. We can't believe your rationale. We will build up to smash your shield. The room is getting hot, and the tempers in it hotter. Something is needed to cool things off. By plan, Reagan invites Gorbachev to go for a walk. The delegations are left behind as the two men make their way to a small house next to a swimming pool. What today is a ruin, in 1985, was a cozy setting for further one-on-one -on -one conversation. We'd have a fire going. And he'd take him in there, and just the two of them would sit with their interpreters and note-takers. The walk to the pool house is just what the dialogue needs. Reagan hands Gorbachev a written proposal for a sweeping reduction in nuclear arms. Gorbachev reads it, and the two leaders chat calmly. Reagan chooses this time to invite the Soviet leader to come to Washington. 
And when he came back from that, they walked into the room where the rest of us were, and they announced, and Reagan announced, that they'd agreed on the next summit is going to be in Washington. And so, you know, they started to have some confidence. They're very different people, but they came to have a respect for each other. How's it going? Two more sessions follow. Each has its ongoing tension and disagreement. Former Soviet Secretary Nikita Khrushchev might have walked out. But those days are over. Out of the talks comes agreement on many issues, from cultural exchanges and air safety procedures to the desire of each country to achieve a 50% reduction of nuclear arms. We wanted to establish an ongoing relationship with the Soviet leadership. And we wanted to establish an agenda of what we were going to address. And by and large, we did that. Undoubtedly, the greatest achievement came in the rapport found between the leaders of nations that had been enemies for 40 years, men whose fingers rest on the button of Armageddon. One always wonders how two leaders will get along. And it's an important thing to wonder about because if the two top leaders disagree, there's no one else you can appeal to. But as it turned out, they did respect each other, and I would say liked each other. Our cooperation, our respectful attitude towards each other assumed that we would talk very candidly, very frankly, and the Americans did that too. Reagan was a great person for human contact. I think once he met Gorbachev at Geneva, uh, there was no way that he was going to uh, continue what was called the Cold War. On the final night of the historic meeting at Geneva, the Reagans entertained the Russian delegation at the villa where they are staying. The Geneva summit has not been a magical solution to troubled relations between superpowers. But the meeting so championed by George Shultz has provided a critically important chance for two men to find rapport where none had existed. Ronald Reagan offers a toast. This summit was a beginning, not an end. We have not closed the door on anything. As Thomas Paine said, we have the power to start the world over again. Mikhail Gorbachev raises his glass and responds. We have started something to dialogue and cooperation. To dialogue and cooperation. <laughs> Reagan and Schultz have barely had a chance to enjoy the success of Geneva when a new foreign policy crisis confronts them. On this night, Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos teeters on the edge of defeat and disgrace. His opponent, in the cause of his pending downfall, is a self-proclaimed ordinary housewife who has never held public office. Corazon Aquino is the widow of slain Philippine reformer Ninoy Aquino, Known to her supporters as Cory, she is about to overthrow one of Asia's most powerful dictators. Her success in this political miracle reflects George Shultz's deep commitment to the ideals of freedom and democracy. As thousands roar their approval of their candidate, it is hard to imagine a Philippines without Marcos. First elected president in 1965, Ferdinand Marcos, supported by his wife Imelda, quickly built a regime infamous for rampant corruption and suppression of the democratic process. When the Constitution prevented him from seeking a third term, he declared martial law and wrote a new Constitution guaranteeing him complete power. In spite of his methods, Cold War America has embraced Marcos for his fierce determination to rid the Philippines of communist rebels. Ronald Reagan, in particular, sees Marcos as a friend and ally. 
George Shultz increasingly sees Marcos as a cunning politician who was allowing his country to fail. We knew a lot about what was going on in the Philippines, and it wasn't very good. The economy was going into the tank. Uh, the system of governance was creaking, and uh, there was a lot of tension. The assassination of Ninoy Aquino failed to kill the movement he founded. Long after his funeral, public resentment over Aquino's murder continues to erode Marco's hold on the Philippines. Now, as Reagan and Schultz are talking to the Soviets in Geneva, Marcos decides to gamble on a long shot. So Marcos called all of a sudden out of the blue a so-called quickie election, but he proved to be wrong because the widow of Nino Aquino turned out to be a rather charismatic figure. Cory Aquino has built her campaign on opposing the corruption of the Marcos government. She comes to represent the full fury of the Filipino people. This opportunity only comes once, so you have to take advantage of it now. Her rallies are attended by thousands. She has the backing of the Catholic Church. Hopes are high as Aquino and her countrymen cast their votes on February 7th, 1986. And I've never been more confident in my life. I'm sure of winning, and I hope to see all of you at my inauguration. But the bold assumption of victory by Aquino and her supporters comes crashing down. When the election results are announced, Ferdinand Marcos claims a convincing win. Aquino voters are saddened, but not surprised by Marco's claim. George Schultz has anticipated the possibility of vote tampering and has already sent representatives to observe the election. We had observers there. Among them was Senator Richard Lugar, who was about as respected a senator on both sides of the aisle as anyone can imagine. What Lugar and others see leaves no doubt. Voting irregularities throughout the 7,000 island nation are massive. In the run-up to the election, Marcos underlings brazenly pass out money for votes. The, the net of what we saw was um, enormous fraud and abuse. In uh, Manila, in some precincts there, we found that systematically people rubbed off the rolls. Luger sends back word that the election has been a sham. He returns to America. We got word, uh, even when I was flying through Hawaii, that George Schultz wanted me to come directly to the Oval Office upon hitting Washington. February 11th, Richard Luger and fellow observer Congressman Jack Murtha come to the Oval Office to brief Reagan, Schultz, and others on the details of the Philippine election. We got to the Oval Office really without passing go and... Um, I told the president uh, that there was massive fraud and abuse. But the president said, well, I, I'm not sure I agree with you. He says, um, I saw on television fraud and abuse on both sides. It is clear that Reagan is struggling with the issue of turning on someone he views as a longtime friend and ally. But reports coming out of the Philippines suggest that the crisis is coming to a head. On February 23rd, Schultz asked all the key officials involved in the crisis to meet at his home in Bethesda, Maryland. Special Envoy Phil Abib has just returned from Manila and says, if Marcos crushes the army rebels, he will move against Aquino next. And I said, we're only interested in one subject. Can Marcos govern? And it was the unanimous conclusion of people from defense and state and CIA and that it reached the point where he was not able to govern. So that afternoon we had a NSC meeting in the Situation Room, and this was presented. And I said, he can't govern, so we should get him out of there. Back in the Philippines, Cardinal Seam, the Archbishop of Manila, calls the election a fraud and declares Aquino the proper winner. As Aquino's supporters begin to sense victory, Hundreds of thousands gather in central Manila. Even some government soldiers join in the celebration. 
but it is a highly charged time. There were big crowds assembling. We sent messages, do not use the Philippine military against these crowds, and they didn't. Marcos' world is collapsing. In spite of the gathering storm breaking over him, he and his wife appear on the balcony of Malacanang Palace, where Imelda sings their theme song to the last of their supporters. Even as Marcos' power fades, the American ambassador cables George Schultz that the man who once had his face carved on a mountainside will only leave office if asked by Ronald Reagan. Schultz is convinced that continued efforts by Marcos to remain in power are an affront to the will of the Philippine people. The United States must take a stand. He tells his boss that for Marcos, the handwriting is on the wall. Reagan at last agrees, Marcos must go. Senator Paul Laxalt, an American well-known to Marcos, is asked to deliver the news. The U.S. will give him shelter, but the Philippine people have spoken. The Marcos era is finished. The old dictator accepts the inevitable. He and Imelda board a plane that carries them to Hawaii. With them are 89 aides and servants, as well as large amounts of currency, gold bars, and jewelry. It will later be revealed that the Marcos hold $800 million in Swiss banks and $250 million in Manhattan real estate, all accumulated on Marcos' salary of $5,700 a year. Jubilant crowds at last enter the Malacanang Palace for the first time in two decades. Among the many luxuries they discover are 6,000 pairs of Mrs. Marcos' shoes. Ronald Reagan has reluctantly forced Ferdinand Marcos to accept defeat, but now he resists recognizing the new government of Cory Aquino. White House Chief of Staff Don Regan is pushing the president to wait, saying Aquino has not officially been declared the winner by the Philippine Assembly. Schultz is convinced the United States cannot pay lip service to democracy and then drag its heels in recognizing a new, freely elected leader. He goes to the Oval Office and argues with Reagan. In heated words, he says, forces on all sides, left and right, are waiting to see if we hesitate. The Filipino people are sending a message. It's loud, it's dramatic, it's clear. Well, we had to make up our minds and take action. And I thought this was clearly the right thing to do. We didn't call the election, Marcus called the election. And the observers were all totally of the same view. Reagan at last concedes. Corazon Aquino will be recognized by the United States as the official new president of the Republic of the Philippines. Against enormous odds, an unknown candidate has won, and the will of her people has been confirmed. The United States extends recognition to this new government, headed by President Aquino. Throughout the crisis, George Shultz has demonstrated the steadiness and cool-headed logic that have made him so valuable to the Reagan administration. His role in Corazon Aquino being able to take her properly won office has put the world on notice. United States support for anti-communist leaders cannot be taken for granted. America, led by George Shultz, has supported those who are willing to fight for democracy and freedom. In the final episode of Turmoil and Triumph, George Shultz and Ronald Reagan meet the Soviets at the momentous Reykjavik summit. It's an event that will do much to end the nuclear arms race. Through it all, George Shultz will struggle to keep all he has accomplished from being consumed in the Iran-Contra scandal. On the next episode of Turmoil and Triumph... Turmoil and Triumph, The George Schultz Years, is available on DVD. For more information or to order a DVD of this program, call 1-800-876-8930 or visit www.freetochoose.net.
Major funding for this program was provided by the Annenberg Foundation, the Stephen Bechtel Fund, Doris and Donald Fisher, John A. Gunn and Cynthia Fry Gunn, the Charles and Ann Johnson Foundation, Peter G. Peterson, Charles Schwab, and Ambassador Thomas and Barbara Stevenson.